afternoon, everybody. My name is Elizabeth Alexander, and I'm president of the Mellon Foundation. And I'm very, very excited to be here today. I'd like to begin by inviting you all to do what you're already doing. Say hello in the chat. There are so many names and many blasts from the past and people from all over who have tuned in to be part of this conversation. And we'd love to know who you are, where you are, and if you have any questions for us today. We hope to see lots of audience engagement throughout in the chat, and we will be able to have some time at the end for audience Q&A. This afternoon is special because I am going to be in conversation with the great Lonnie Bunch for a wide ranging conversation about the state of our union. There you are. I've been waiting to see your face. Hello, Secretary Bunch. Well, hello. It's such a treat. I have waited all day to be able to spend time with you. I'm very pleased. Here we are. This is this is wonderful. And we're going to be talking about the state, what we're calling the state of our union and how we can better tell and understand the American story in all of its richness. We are living in a time, it is no surprise to anyone, that the practice of history and democracy in the United States is clearly in turmoil. This is an energizing time, one of possibility for widespread change and evolution, some of which has already happened, some of which will never turn back, and also one of profound challenges. And as such, the work of public institutions like the Smithsonian is ever more urgent in creating public educational spaces for people of all ages. Secretary Bunch, I believe that our mutual investment and learning in African-American studies, in history, and in arts and culture have given us both in our, in our deep bones, in our training, in our outlook, uh, a way of understanding our collective history, a history that perpetually informs our present and shapes our future, sometimes in contradiction. That work and those big questions about who we are and who we will become are just some of the things I'm looking forward to discussing with you today. So as we begin, let me give a brief formal introduction. Secretary Lonnie G. Bunch III is the 14th Secretary of the Smithsonian, overseeing 21 museums, 21 libraries, the National Zoo, numerous research centers, and several education units and centers. He is the first humanist to hold this position, an important distinction when we think about the work that the Smithsonian undertakes to represent and teach our country's history. Lonnie was the founding director of the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture, and I hear that great cheer rising up from the ether, uh, about that e extraordinary uh, museum, following distinguished positions at the Chicago Historical Society, the National Museum of American History, and the California African American Museum in Los Angeles. A widely published author, Secretary Bunch, has written on topics ranging from the Black military experience, the American presidency, African American history in California, diversity in museum management, and the impact of funding and politics on American museums. Among many honors, in 2005, he was named one of the 100 most influential museum professionals of the 20th century by the American Association of Museums. Lonnie Bunch, thank you for joining me in conversation. Oh, I am so excited to be here. And all you got to say when he introduced me is I'm just some guy from Jersey trying to make it in the big city. See, and we're going to get to Jersey. You know, I, I knew that there, I didn't know the Jersey moment would come so early, <laughs> but I have a Jersey question and we will get there. <laughs> so let's jump right in. Um, you and I have both, uh, you know, done some building over the decades um, in ways uh, material in your case uh, and in the world of cultural and culture and ideas in my place, um, exploring and uplifting African American history, art, and culture. And at, as a historian and at the Smithsonian, you've uh, done you know indelible work emphasizing that, and I saw this as your mantra, African-American history is American history. So to open us up, I'd like to know, where do you think we are in that project? Not just in the museum, but as a nation. You know, for me, 
Um, this is really the quintessential question, right? Um, when we built the museum, there were really two goals. One was to centralize African-American history so that it's not seen as ancillary or marginal, but seen as quintessential, central to our understanding of who we are. The other piece was the desire to sort of help people find racialized memory. As one person said to me, your job is to help us remember not just what we want to remember, but what we need to remember. So I think in some ways, the African American Museum has become that beacon that raises those questions, that on the National Mall gives everybody the opportunity to explore what it means to be an American through that lens. But when I look around the country, on the one hand, I find things that give me uh, a sense that there's movement, right? You think of the new museums that have opened, um, the Legacy Museum in Montgomery, the International Museum uh, that they're gonna do in Charleston, but you think about also how you see African-American culture reflected in poetry, in film, in theater, in ways that you didn't before. But I guess the worry I have is that, you know, there's a shadow over this. There's a kind of sense that these stories, as important as they are, are not stories that all Americans need to know. And the sense that somehow it's essential to protect America from some of these stories is what gives me great pause. So on the one hand, I am really pleased to see this germination of this amazing history and culture. On the other hand, I really am worried about that shadow that is really affecting um, not only university professors, but really teachers and other areas. So ultimately, I am hopeful, but worried. What about you? Yeah. I am, look, on the one hand, I mean, you know, I grew up in Washington, D.C., and the Smithsonian was a an absolutely critical part of my education. We went regularly to all of the different Smithsonian's in school. It was somewhere that we were sometimes allowed to go on our own. Um, we went all the time, and uh, the and I and I learned many, 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 many things. So this was before the Air and Space Museum had been built. This is before, uh, but to go now. I mean, what I do remember is that. African American history that there was sort of a timeline in the Museum of African of American history that ended with some very sad looking slaves right yeah. you know and like that was African American history and I remember it very vividly um and I remember feeling sad and I remember also feeling <laughs> what did I just learn is is that who we are is that where it ends is everybody sad um you know so to go now as an adult and to be able to, you know, first of all, just to behold the museum, you know, to see it in its, you know, beauty and cultural integrity um, in the way that it, it, it really is the most beautiful thing that you see. And then, you know, to go in and not only have the extraordinary experience that I've had, that my kids have had, that my colleagues have had, but that you witness people having all around you and those people, mm -hmm. as you know, are not all black people. So, you know, progress, that is progress right there. You know, that is progress in a way that is importantly symbolic because the buildings of the Smithsonian, the institutions of the Smithsonian are quintessentially American monuments. I mean, you might think of the Smithsonian as quintessentially America's public knowledge teacher. I mean, public knowledge is taught in many places, but I don't think that the, you know, conglomeration of things that the Smithsonian teaches is found anywhere else accessible, free to the public, you know, right in, in the middle of, of the city. So, you know, you know we, we can't turn. No, no. Well, no, just to say we can't turn from that. And also that came of a long journey. Obviously, it came of your working with and others working with many administrations. It was a political feat. But I say all this to say it's there and it's there forever. So please, and that that's the progress part. And I have the alarm part after. Let me just simply say that I, I think you've captured it so well. And the simple way I look at that is that 45% of the millions of visitors that have come there are not African-American. 
makes it one of the most diversely visited museums. And as you've said, the mall is where the world comes to learn what it means to be an American. And so to be able to sort of make mm -hmm. sure exactly. that story is central is absolutely right. So thank you for for sort of identifying what I, what we hoped would happen. Yes, no, absolutely. But, you know, to the alarm, I mean, you know, there are so many places we could look, but one need only turn to the state of Florida, uh, you know, to look at the way. I mean, it is Exhibit A right now, uh, a governor who has a national profile and who is using his platform right now to ban the teaching of an AP African-American studies course which but because saying it has no educational value this of course put together by the college board with scholars with panels over many 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 years and just who has no value fine call me names but can't be taught and the whole woke bill i mean that's what it's called that says that if you know you teach african american history to to people it will make them feel guilty and therefore you can't teach it. You know, that history is, this was the latest thing I saw, uh, facts, dry facts to be cut and pasted and learned. No. I mean, it, you know, I mean, that's uh, untrue. No matter where you sit, that is untrue. So I do find that very alarming. I, I, I'm heartened by the things that, uh, you know, there's a retired Florida International University professor named Marvin Dunn, who I'm sure you've read about, who is teaching. He's taking people around and and teaching on his own and teaching about lynching in Florida, uh, where, you know, there were more lynchings in Florida than in Alabama. So, you know, it's a history that must be told folks are doing it, but he's doing it at risk to himself and the people that he's teaching. You know, and he's doing and, and everybody that's doing it is really at risk. Right. You see the number of um, the fact that Florida is the bellwether, but there are 42 states that have legislation pending preventing people from talking about these issues under the rubric of critical race theory. Right. And so what's amazing to me is that right now there is something like 17 million high school and middle school students who are in set in, in in parts of the country where that history can't be taught, that they are now losing the opportunity to sort of be made better by the fullness of this story. I think the for me, the the real challenge is that you think about, you hear about America, you know, it's the home of the brave, but we're not brave enough to face our history. We're not brave enough to understand that what that history really tells us is that the, these people are folks who have struggled to help America live up to its stated ideals. Is not that something to celebrate and to grapple with rather than simply be afraid of? So I, I am really upset because, you know, we were involved in helping to create that AP course and the notion that somehow simply having a course that forces us to understand complexity nuance and ambiguity is a problem that's a problem for all of america well that's right and i think also there is a a, a very dangerous misunderstanding about what it is to learn that when you learn that when anybody learns history that they are somehow in it in a way that they could feel guilty i mean you know that is hardly the point none of us was there <laughs> None of us was there. It's separate work to be accountable for, you know, your misdeeds, but the putting yourself into something that actually anybody can learn is, I think, also a very disturbing mischaracterizing of, of what history and learning are. So, I mean, I think, you know, to, to, to the ongoing conversation, what are people, I mean, so therefore the Smithsonian is a bulwark against that because anyone can come, anyone can learn. Um, but how else do you see uh, or do you think that people can respond to this moment? You know, I really think that this is a classic case that you've got to respond and respond clearly. On the one hand, I think it's incumbent upon those of us that care about culture, that care about history, to do something we rarely do, which is to explain to the mass public why history matters. 
Why is it important to understand this, this story, these complexities? I think very strongly, for example, one of the great strengths of history is that it teaches you to embrace ambiguity. And if we could, mm -hmm. as Americans, instead of looking for simple answers to complex questions, embrace that ambiguity. And that's what history teaches us. And when you're taking it away and saying, here are the cut up facts, um, learn them. What you're doing is saying to people, nuance, complexity, subtlety, debate, doesn't matter. And yet it's all of that that has shaped what this country says it is. And so I think it really is more than a fight for those of us that care about African-American culture. It ought to be a fight for all who care about education and who care about the notion of America as a work in progress, um, rather than a notion as a we're now at the place where we can stop um, making people feel guilty. Uh, for me, That's the right. notion of divisive history, um, um, history is always divisive. Um, and I just think people are brave enough to understand that complexity. Um, let's give them some credit. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we call this conversation the state of our union, uh, which, of course, usually refers to the president's address to the government and the nation about the state of the body politic in a governmental sense and in relation to policies. But we're using the same phrase in a different context to talk about the state of our current collective understanding of our country's history and how it informs our present and our future as America. So to go further, I, I, I'd like to hear about your assessment of the State of the Union now and also how in your work you are thinking about enriching the body politic and, you know, helping us understand this infinitely fascinating thing called Americanness. You know, in some ways, when I think about it in a positive sense, I think about the work you've done, the work that scholars have done over the last 30 years that have really broadened our understanding of the American narrative. I mean, the work that's being done is really crucially important on issues of race, on gender, um, on migration and immigration. So on the one hand, I'm feeling very good about that academic foundation. I'm also feeling good that when um, UCLA did a survey um, looking at what people wanted to have their children educated, you know, um, a significant majority said it's OK to talk about complexity. It's OK to talk about race. So there's a there's a significant group of people that want to learn. And I think that's very positive. I think that, as we've said, there are museums that are grappling with this. There are sort of cultural exp expressions that really allow us to see the importance of history. But I do think that the challenge is, um, one, recognizing that history is important for everybody. And therefore, we need to find ways to shape it so that people say, I care about this. Not, not history as nostalgia but history as a tool that helps you live your life today. Um, and I think so for me at the Smithsonian, the goal is to have that contemporary resonance. As a historian sitting as a secretary, contextualization and the contemporary resonance are really the mantras that I pushed throughout the Smithsonian. And I think that notion of saying, how are cultural institutions of value in traditional ways, great exhibitions, traditional education programs, but in non-traditional ways, in providing people tools, and providing people um, the kind of energy to sort of struggle. Um, in some ways, I've always felt the African-American Museum, its job was really to create new generations of activists who look back and say, look at the changes that people made. And it's really now our turn to continue that work in progress. So I think it really is sort of creating this groundswell of understanding and a groundswell, candidly, that is willing to politically push back, because this is what's mm -hmm. going to be around for a while unless we push back very strongly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I wanted to talk to you when about you, building When you think collection. about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, let me just ask you, though, when you think about it, um, this whole question of state, what gives you pause and what gives you hope? Well, so many things uh, give me hope every single day. And, you know, the, the, the wonderful thing about the work that um, we're doing at the Mellon Foundation is that we're able to 
see kind of across the land all sorts of things that people are doing in arts and culture, in museums, in the performing arts, in archives and libraries, uh, in the teaching of university history and humanities in higher education. Um, so people are doing incredible things. And bringing a social justice focus to the Mellon Foundation, as I did when I came in, has meant that, you know, our principle of lifting up under-recognized and under-resourced voices uh, has meant that we are, are hearing so many different stories that, you know, we might have known and that pe people hold their history forever. People don't let their history go. But now um, it's available to, to so many more people. And so when you see people's imaginations catalyzed and ready to go and what a foundation's resources can let them do, um, that is, you know, a hopeful thing all day long. Um, when I think about also some of our, you know, initiatives and what it has meant to have this monuments project, which, you know, where, where it's where we have dedicated, the, it's our biggest initiative ever, thinking about how our stories are told in commemorative space across the country. The way that, you know, it didn't used to be, for example, that all of the names and stories of Japanese Americans who were interned had been gathered in one place. And now they are gathered in one place. They are in a sacred book, which I saw recently, where people are bringing their elders to visit and put their hands and make their marks on that book with soil from the 75 camps that intern Japanese Americans, and that will be a memorial. But the first part of the memorial is not just putting it up in the ground, it's bringing people and elders together to say, now my story will be remembered, now my family's name is there. So I could tell you 5,000 stories like that, which is what my work is like every single day. So I stay absolutely hopeful and, um, uh, alive in my warrior spirit, uh, which is what it takes to deal with all this nonsense. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and in thinking about, you know, um, uh, now, you know, as the uber, uber, uber museum guy, <laughs> um, I've always been really interested in um, how you think about collections and collecting and objects um, because I, I think, I mean, the first time that I encountered your work was at the Historical Society. So in Chicago, uh, when we both lived there. So, you know, I've, I've seen that, that sense of, of, of hand for, for a long time. Um, and I just had to share. So my, I can't really choose a favorite object in the, in the National Museum of African American History and Culture. But if I had to, it would be Ashley's sack which I wanted to just put out there for people to hear. Uh, it was, it is a flower sack from the mid 19th century. And on it is text embroidered that I think is a poem, which is why I wanted to read it. My great grandmother Rose, mother of Ashley, gave her this sack when she was sold at age nine in South Carolina. It held a tattered dress three handfuls of pecans, a braid of roses hair. Told her it be filled with my love always. She never saw her again. Ashley is my grandmother, Ruth Middleton. So talk to me about objects and their, and their power and how you think about, about them. Well, in some ways, as you were talking about the stories that move me, it's the artifacts that move me. Because first of all, it's the power of the authentic, right? It's the way you responded to that poem and to Ashley Sack. Mm -hmm. it's, it's the way people really break down and embrace each other when they're looking at Emmett Till's casket. Um, it's also yeah. the way... That you know, what an artifact does, what an object does is in some ways, while it gives people something that they're familiar with, so it makes it easier for them, but often it gives them cover because if they're exploring something mm. difficult, the object gives them something to look at as they're thinking about the complexity of slavery or the migration. And so for me, it's both about how do objects help people understand the past, 
but also how do those objects then really lead us to stories? Because I have never been somebody who believed in objects for objects sake. I've always felt artifacts are really a way into the stories, in some ways, a poetic way into the stories. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I, I'm always, I mean, I couldn't choose my favorite, but if I had to, for me, it really yeah. is something by a man named Joseph Trammell. Joseph Trammell was enslaved and gave, gained his freedom in Virginia in the 1850s, and he had his freedom paper. And he knew that if something happened to that paper, his whole family's future would be destroyed. So he wasn't very good with his hands. He made what he called a handmade tin wallet, pretty ugly. But what he did mm -hmm. is in that wallet, he would put that paper and he would carry it with him so it wouldn't be destroyed by perspiration or anything. And then every night he would go home. And according to family lore, he would pull it out, put it on the mantelpiece and talk about the fragility of freedom. Talk about the importance mm -hmm. of freedom. Um, talk about the responsibility of younger generations to maintain that freedom. And the family kept that for five generations and gave it to us. It's to me, that's the kind of thing that says it's just a box. No, it isn't. It's really a life. It's really about hope. And it's really about believing. Um, believing when you shouldn't really believe, believing in a possible future that wasn't there. And so for me, it's the objects that allow in the in the best case, it makes it easy for people to engage with these stories because the most important thing the African American Museum did um, was humanize history. That we really tell the grand stories, but we wanted to humanize it, whether it's through Ashley Sack to understand the domestic slave trade. Um, or Emmett Till's casket to understand violence and how violence has always been used to reinforce racism in this country. So for me, the objects were really a way, yes, I had to do them to build a museum, but they were really a way to gain stories. And as you know, part of the reason we did this is because there were no collections at the Smithsonian, really. And so the notion was, how do you build these collections? So, uh, you know, the story is, and it's a true story, I fell asleep in front of the television and woke up and there was the Antiques Roadshow. And I had never seen that before. And I thought, what a really good idea. So we, we mm -hmm. renamed it, you know, Finding African American Treasures and went around the country helping people not bring us to collections, but to preserve grandma's old shawl or that 19th century photograph. But what it did is we, we heard those stories, but it brought hundreds of people out to share their stories, to talk about. And I remember so powerfully uh, a grandfather um, talking to his grandson about a plow. He brought a plow head and he said, let me talk to you about how hard it was to plow. And he could suddenly see that he was telling something that he had never shared before. And he starts crying mm -hmm. to tell his grandson about what he went through. And so for me, these were really the way to make sure that we heard the stories of you know, Nat Turner and Harriet Tubman and, you know, but we also wanted to hear the stories of people who were famous only to their family. And that's what makes, I think, yes. for me, it's just of collecting artifacts. Well, and, you know, I'm seeing in the chat that Mr. Trammell's great, great grandchild is on the chat and is so excited to hear you telling this story. So, uh, that is a beautiful thing. And, uh, and I think also, you know, what, what you say about the collecting and antiques roadshow, you know, goes to what I was pointing out earlier. Even when people say our history is lost, it can be, but mostly we are keeping it. And so the question is how to keep it even safer you know, to to give it the protection that it needs and to make sure that it's put alongside other stories so that the collective uh, of our experience can be told. Because um, what we I, did, I also, yeah. I was gonna say, what we did was really try to make sure that part of what we did was help you preserve something in your home. We didn't say bring, give it all to institutions, although we encourage people mm -hmm. to think locally first. But then the notion was that could we really find enough of the cultural patrimony? And the truth of the matter is, we found 40,000 objects of which 70% came 
came from basements, trunks, and attics of people's homes. It's what you said. There is this amazing reservoir that people have kept that nobody really knew about or thought that it was important enough to ask. And as a result of that, I think it stimulated those notions around the country. Um, and so for me, it was not so much what we collected, but what we preserved, whether we preserved it in your home, or we preserved it in a cultural institution. And that to me is one of the, for my eye, from where I sat, one of the great contributions of the museum to say, these are artifacts. These are stories that are available. Just do a little work to look. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, so here we're talking about keeping objects, and you recently gave some objects away uh, uh, that was a, a real institutional doing the right thing, and you did it in such a way that you made it um, exemplary and usable for other people. And I'm talking about, you know, the return uh, of the Benin bronzes. If you could tell us that story and your thinking behind it. You know, I've really felt that in some ways the Smithsonian is a great leader, a great scholarship, great collections, but I also wanted to make sure it was an ethical leader, that it led in areas that said, this is the way museums need to think about their collections, but candidly about their stewardship. You know, for me, the notion was, I always hated when I heard museums say, we own these objects. What you really are are a steward those objects. And so what we thought about was how do we help um, think about returning objects and sharing stewardship? So I put together scholars and we came with a policy and I said, I want to make sure that we look ethically at what we've collected and that may mean returning. And so um, when we began to do this, we looked at, because I'd heard a lot, I'd talked for years to the British Museum and others about the Benin bronzes, and I said, well, you know what, um, in concert with the Director of African Art, I said, all right, let's see if we can do this. So I said, first of all, then, the key is to have the policy. The second is to do the research to make sure these were bronzes that were stolen in the punitive rage of 1897, and then determine if they were where they should go back. And so we negotiated with the government of Nigeria, um, and we determined that there were 39 uh, Benin bronzes that we had. And what was so powerful is we said, we will return complete ownership. But they also said, could you keep seven or eight so that therefore you could help the public understand why repatriation is important and also to be able to tell yeah. that story. So for me, it was a great win. It was saying, we are a different institution. We recognize that it's okay to return these things. In fact, it's it's incumbent upon us. And then my hope was that, um, candidly, museums love models and messiahs, right? That's what they do. They love to follow. Mm -hmm. and I, I really wanted to put pressure on other institutions, not necessarily to return Benin bronzes, but I hope they do. But it really is to say, this is the 21st century. You have different ethical standards than you did when you began your collections. So if you could look at this material, and not all of it is going to be returned because there are people in countries that don't want it, but it's also important to have the conversation. So for me, this is really about my belief that the Smithsonian has to be a value in non-traditional ways. And this is really asking mm -hmm. the fundamental question, how do we lead not just with our scholarship, not just with our collections, but with our ethical posture. Mm, mm, beautiful. And the way that it, you know, as a, as a sort of public act, uh, it, it came across as simply, this is the right thing to do. And I think that it can get a little complicated when it's not. And so uh, I, I appreciated that, that clarity. Um, I'd love to understand more about your job, this big old job. Uh, how do you think about all that you preside <laughs> over? How do you get your head around it? How do you sort of uh, approach your leadership? Well, you know, in some ways, it's what, as, as you were, I was listening to you talk about what you're doing with the melon. It is really, what is the vision, the broad vision of what's possible? Um, how do you make sure that, on the one hand, you'll never get your arms completely around the whole Smithsonian? So what you want to do mm -hmm. is understand the parts. Right. Understand mm -hmm. what's important at the Museum of Natural History or what's important at the zoo, but then make sure that your vision is shaping how they're moving forward. Um, in some ways, the biggest challenge is making sure that 
everybody understands that there is a shared vision. Um, because the greatest challenge of the Smithsonian, I would argue, is that the Smithsonian is full of brilliant parts. And so the question mm. is, how do you bring them together as one Smithsonian? Uh, I think about um, I think about sort of you know, even the story of the Benin bronzes. Well, we could talk about that in natural history. We could talk about the history of that in American history. And so trying to figure out how we actually can have the greatest impact by actually working with each other is really important. Mm -hmm. And then secondly, what I realized is that the Smithsonian doesn't have broad enough shoulders to do everything. So it really is looking to collaborate collaborating with the Mellon Foundation, collaborating with other cultural institutions, collaborating with other countries. So it's really my goal to try to redefine what a 21st century museum complex is and to find the right tension between the traditions of what we've done and innovation, whether it's the new, you know, doing more digitally, um, basically finding ways to work with smaller museums around the country, um, and also recognizing that the Smithsonian has an international obligation to make sure that we're doing work that both shapes the international community, but that community then shapes what we're doing. So it is really the sort of greatest job I could ever ask for, but, it, but as you could imagine, there are days where the water is just coming so much and you're thinking, hope I can keep swimming today. <laughs> and what would be an example of just a small pleasure of doing your job, something you get to see somewhere you a door that opens for you because you have that job? You know, last night I spoke at um, a, cl a, cl a club somewhere and there were 200 people. And for me, the joy of seeing the passion people have for the Smithsonian, that it's almost as you talked about it, everybody has their memory, but everybody has sort of a sense that this means so much. It means so much to them and it means so much to the country. So part of that joy is doing that. But the other part of the joy is, and I'll be very candid, is always finding ways to do history. Um, you know, yeah, yeah. you write as often as you can. And for me, I've got to write as a historian because you, you can't lose your soul no matter what you're doing. So it's always mm -hmm. trying to find those moments where you commit. Uh, recently, I was in Portugal helping people talk about what's the impact of the slave trade in Portugal. That gives me, that excites me. That gives me things that allow me to move forward. So it is really sort of the opportunity to say, how does the Smithsonian matter in ways that we haven't traditionally thought? And how do we continue to serve our publics, but how do we really use the trust we have to encourage people to grapple with their history, to encourage people to think about climate change, to really use the resources of the Smithsonian to say, how does the Smithsonian help make a country better? How does it give mm -hmm. you tools to do that? So that's kind of what really excites me about being at the Smithsonian. Well, and can how, I tell you, you know, another story? Yes, you can tell me stories oh. and stories. <laughs> well, but you know, the, but I'll tell you the fundamental reason why the Smithsonian means so much to me. So I'm 10 years old during the centennial of the Civil War, and we grew up in New Jersey, but my mother's family is in North Carolina. So we're driving to North Carolina, and I see, you know, battlefields in Richmond and Petersburg and the Museum of the Confederacy, and I'm begging my father, let me, let's stop. I want to see this. I'm 10 years old. He always found excuses not to stop. And on the way back, he wouldn't stop. And then instead of going to New Jersey, he pulled into Washington and pulled into the Smithsonian and said, here's a place where you can go, understand yourself, grapple with history, but not be turned away because of the color of your skin. He knew we couldn't go in those places, but I didn't know that. And so for me, wow. I've never forgotten that the Smithsonian gave a 10-year-old kid a home, even if it was just for two hours. And mm -hmm. so I have got so to be able to sort of repay that debt by sort of leading the Smithsonian in the 21st century really sort of nurtures my soul and makes me think of my dad, mm -hmm. who's no longer here. Oh, beautiful, beautiful. Well, well, thinking about public institutions and they're not only how how they inhabit their duty. How do you think about um, other public institutions, either in the the country or that you've seen around the world, um, that you think that you could tell us about that are, are doing important work to this, you know, sharing our history and and really doing it well. 
You know, I think that um, everybody is struggling with expanding the national narrative, right? Everybody is struggling to think about um, what does the African presence mean in Brazil. Um, and so for me, it's really learning what's going on globally. But there's a place that I draw from uh, time and time again. It's a museum in New Zealand called Te Papa the National Museum of New mm -hmm. Zealand. And part of why I draw from it is that they tell the story of New Zealand through two, two lenses. One is the Maori lens, one is the British lens. And it's fascinating to see where, where the Maoris thought their agreements were one way, the British thought it was another. It really helped me understand the conflicting notions of what nationalism is in New Zealand. I think they do it as a museum, one of the best I've ever seen. And then I guess the other place that just moves me to no end is really the Tenement Museum in New York. I mean, I think mm, the notion yes. of taking, you know, a sense of place and helping people recognize that different people live there, um, had both common experiences and very different experiences. In a way, the Tenement Museum humanizes the story of late 19th and early 20th century in a way because it's talking about home, because we can all understand home. And so those are places that I think do brilliant work um, that really help the public better understand who they once were, contextualize who they are today, and point them towards, I think, a better shared future. I, I don't know the um, the museum in New Zealand, but the Tenement Museum I've been to many times, and I agree with you on that. I think also unlike most museums which are in large buildings high ceilings uh you know, this is you go into cramped tenement apartments so at the at the body level uh you can have an empathetic experience about how people lived decades before and how people continue to live and so i think that you know just sort of the physical experience of that is is amazing 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 I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about philanthropy, because I think that in some ways, you know, I've learned in my career, the crucial role that philanthropy plays, you know, not just in helping institutions, but in shaping our notions of history and identity. And I wonder if you could talk about, you know, how that plays out in your mind, both at the Mellon, but philanthropy writ large. Yes, well, I think that, you know, philanthropy is, is an interesting space of resources that is um, manifests in the storytelling that we do when we say, this is what we fund. And this is the, both the subject area, but also this is the work that we fund. So the Mellon Foundation, arts, culture, humanities and higher education, prison higher education, libraries, archives, and humanities in place. That is what we fund. As we spoke about earlier, you know, we, we you know, our responsibility is to learn and learn and learn and meet with people who are doing work and cover the waterfront so that out of that, we're not only stewarding our resources so that they can go to people who we think can be successful with ex their extraordinary projects, but that also with our strategic choices, it tells a larger story. Uh, it expands a story. In this case, since we focused not all, but most of our work in the United States at this particular moment in time, you know, to the diversity of American spaces, places, histories, stories, experiences, lives. What does it mean for the work to be just? Is I think, you know, I was first uh, briefly at the Ford Foundation working with the great Darren Walker. Uh, and so, you know, I mean, that was, you know, kind of a life changing moment because he knew that my orientation coming from African American studies, coming from the academy, coming from my family, coming from my writing, coming from my commitments was about justice and fairness and access and exhilaration about what it means to open things up in that way. But then to be able to do a kind of scaling in philanthropy, to be able to move more quickly than you can in the academy because of the structures of philanthropy. Philanthropy is not free space. It has laws. It is governed. The laws are, uh, you know, very particular. You have to follow them. 
But if we have a will to do so, we can move fast. And so I think, you know, what I learned at Ford, what I take to Mellon, what suits who I am is you have to do the work now. You have to continue to push forward. You have to be very, very assertive about change if you need to to make it. You have to be consistent about what it means to make, you know, a fair and ethical workplace, what it means to do justice work. And and the beauty of, of how we're doing it at Mellon is that it takes so many different forms. Uh, and what I see in the field, which isn't all one thing, you know, there are foundations that are run by people who are living and it's their money. You know, there are foundations with donors who died a long time ago, but said it needed to be done in a certain way. There are others that have a different kind of freedom, big ones, small ones, local ones, um, you know, dedicated ones. But what I hope, the, the, the energy and the wind that I hope to share with my colleagues is that these vast resources are disproportionately held and need to be redistributed with a quickness, period. That's what I think we need to be doing. I think that's, I mean, in some ways, what I love so much about what you're doing is it is it comes from a sense of scholarship, but also a sense of commitment. Um, and for me, it really is about how do museums play a social justice role? How are they both the glue that holds nations together, but how are they also forced to challenge um, to really give people, Absolutely. since the trusted source, to give them that opportunity to, to fight for the good fight? Um, and to me, that's what this is about. Yes, and in, in ways that are so much more varied and interesting than, you know, I'm very rebellious about Black History Month. I refuse to open my mouth in the month of February <laughs> because <laughs> I think that, you know, the range of stories that there are, um, I mean, they're infinite. You know, you haven't exhausted them. I haven't exhausted them. My mother, who's a historian, hasn't exhausted them. Um, it, it is infinite. And also, I think, infinitely fascinating because when you think about so many of our histories, they are histories of struggle, resilience, tremendous darkness, overcoming, ingenuity, skill, brilliance, mm -hmm. um, all of that for everybody. We exactly. all need to know how to get over in this life. We all need examples of courage. So I think that there is is so much to be found there. You know, I think that is, you know, people once said to me, you know, why are you doing so much work on slavery in the museum? I said, in part, because I wish we were as strong as our enslaved ancestors, right? I mean, this mm -hmm. notion of people who were creative, who believed in an America that didn't believe in them through the next couple of generations. I mean, for me, it's the greatest inspiration is that I always felt that building a museum was my way of honoring my ancestors, um, who I don't even know, mm -hmm. but the struggle they had, um, this is their way to, so this was my way to say, thank you, not just for your lives, but for your inspiration. Um, and thank you yes. for what you've done in a way to make America better. And, and so that's why I think African-American culture and history is really something everybody needs to dip into because it will challenge you help a country live up to its ideals. And what's wrong with that? That's right. That's right. Um, I have so many questions for you. I'm going to ask one more before we turn to, I, there are so many terrific questions in the chat. So I want us to get to those. But first, I want to just talk to you about the specificity of place and the specificity of place in this country. And I want to talk to you about Jerseyness, which, uh, you know, I saw you on the Dionne Warwick documentary. <laughs> and which was, and she was talking about her jersey, and you were talking about your jersey. Um, but I, you know, I love when people have a, a sense that they come from a place, and it means something. So I'd love to know mm -hmm. what 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 East Orange means to you, being from there. Well, you know, um, when I built the museum, one of the things we wanted to do was to really have a major exhibition on the power of place, because I really didn't want people to think the African-American experience was summed up by one place. And so I think, you mm -hmm. know, recognizing how if you're in Angola prison, that shapes your experience. If you're in the age of hip hop in the Bronx, it shapes your experience. So for me, it was about place because 
Growing up in New Jersey, I grew up in a town that was predominantly white and Italian. And so I had to learn to straddle many worlds. And so that sense of being being treated unfairly really stimulated in me a sense of fairness for everyone. So it really is mm -hmm. what is at the heart of sort of my social justice fighting. But I must say the one thing that my Jerseyness is pretty simple. New Jersey taught me mm -hmm. how to fight, when to run, and when to talk my way out of things. And that's really served me in good stead my whole career. <laughs> so that's the importance <laughs> of the power of place for me. <laughs> there you go. I love that. Um, well, I'm gonna. I'm, I'm turning my eyes to this incredible scroll. So I'm just gonna jump in from Jazetta Marshburn. Uh, oh, an archivist at the Smithsonian. Preservation. Do you have any tips or advice for those trying to preserve history of people in their small town? I think that. Um, this is what I mean about sort of collaboration and not having broad enough shoulders. I think that I've been fascinated in small towns how librarians really are interested in playing a role in helping to people preserve their culture. And so part of what the things I've always encouraged is that one, learn. There are a lot of on, on the web work that helps you understand how to preserve old photographs and the like, but really work with your local library and your local archives, especially your library, because they're really interested in helping you preserve this material. And it also will help you determine, is this something that I need to keep in my family? Or is this something that that would maybe help the broader community better understand itself. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Um, from Felix Matos Rodriguez, the chancellor of the City University of New York. History is often tied, uh, and a historian, um, history is often tied heavily with modern identity. People have a strong sense of ownership of the history they grew up learning. As we discover untold or ignored stories and the complex nuances of historical events or people, we rightfully update the historic record and sometimes revise those histories. How do we balance the sentiment built over time with our more nuanced understanding? Really interesting. It's a great question. I mean, I think that part of this is, as educators, helping people move from A to B, right? So part of it is really sort of um, recognizing why we had the initial interpretations we have, but really to convey clearly how we got to the new interpretation, right? So that in essence, it's my notion that often we historians forget to talk about how we do the work we do, why we do the work we do, and why it's important for the general public. I also think that what it then means is that what we're really trying to do is find the right tension the right tension between the way we once interpreted and the way we're moving in new directions. And I think one of the things we failed as historians is to help the public understand that revisionism isn't a dirty word. Um, revisionism is mm -hmm. what we've done our whole career. Um, and I think that this notion, whether it is the evolution of African-American poetry and how that's changed over time, um, I think we just want people to understand that change is what we do, that you think history is this immutable moment that never changes. But what it really is, is a moment that changes based on knowledge, based on new ideas, mm -hmm. based on new interpretations based on things that are more important. So I think that it really isn't coming upon us to find that right tension, but part of it is removing the veil. You know, we love the fact that, you know, we're historians, we know how to do this. Um, open the veil a little bit, let people see it. And I think that'll make it better for people to be able to understand change and revisionism. Mm. Well, and I, well, I love that answer because I think also if we understand revisionism as steady state, Yes. You, you know that 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 as we as we learn more, we shift the angle, we shift the kaleidoscope. Y you know, we hear from other people. I mean, that is if if we're listening and alive, that is how life is. Exactly. Um, exactly. So so I, I love that. Um, this question is from Idris Brewster, founder and executive director of the wonderful organization Kinfolk. How does art and technology play a role in telling the American story? Can the combination of art and technology play a role in carrying out our, our traditions of sharing our history in a more accessible way? 
And yeah, we haven't talked yet about technology and you've got so much to say about that at, at, at the Smithsonian. Well, I mean, I think, as you know, um, you know, culture is one of the most important ways to convey history, to find ways to, to tie us together. And I think in many ways, we've always found that art expressed things that we wanted to write about, that art really gave us a better sense of understanding on different levels certain stories, certain complexities, certain histories, um, and also challenging us not to be in a simple box, but to think outside of that box. So I think that art is crucially important. I think that um, one of the things that has happened, I would argue, over the last 30 years is historians have begun to recognize that there is source material, there's information they can gather beyond documents, whether it's through art or film or poetry. And I think that's crucially important. I also think technology is, uh, you know, I, I hate to be the one always using tension, but I'm really looking for the tension between tradition and innovation. I really think that what technology allows us to do is, on the one hand, reach millions of more people. Think about the Smithsonian. Now, we get 39, before the pandemic, 39 to 40 million visitors annually. When the pandemic, we probably reached 100 million. Um, and so really recognizing that this gives us, if the work that you do is important, if the stories you tell are about social justice that can make a nation better, don't you want a broader audience to grapple with it? And I also think most importantly, what technology gives us today is a two-way street. It is not the sort of museums and scholars on high. It's suddenly recognizing what are we learning? from those stories of communities. Um, and so in a way, this is really an opportunity to sort of democratize the work we do, um, to make it more accessible, but to make those of us whose job it is to tell that history, make us better by expanding the pool that we can dip into to understand and interpret. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There was a, a related question. Um, that I am looking for that was, I'll paraphrase it, um, uh, uh, how more specifically even about artists, how are each of us uh, 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 supporting the work of artists to activate our archives? Yeah, I mean, I think that there are really a couple of issues here. One is just the notion of providing the space and the support for artists, right? To recognize mm -hmm. that um, this is something that really is incumbent upon us to make sure that um, people can live on their art and off their art, right? Um, and I think that for me, art, it's really, uh, you know, forgive me, I'm, I'm, you know, it's art, it's culture, it's poetry, it's film. It just seems to me that there is a way for us to better understand where we're trying to get to if we can really embrace more fully the opportunities to draw from that culture. And so the different experiences really make us better as historians. So ultimately for me, it's really about recognizing that supporting art is supporting the artist, but it's also supporting in different ways to look the culture that means so much to so many of us. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, absolutely. I've always been interested in this question of how artists come to archives, because I think that certainly in the case of poets, um, if you want uh, the essential truth in essential language to be extracted from an archive, uh, send a poet uh, to, to, to do that work. Um, so um, I think about some projects, the Astor Gates Rebuild Project that we're supporting in Chicago. It has many different pieces to it, but one is bringing in uh, uh, artists and writers to work with a very, very difficult archive of images of lynching and images of um, caricatures of African-Americans. So, you know, that's yielding some very, very fascinating work. There is a project that we're supporting with uh, the Museum Laxart and with the Museum of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles, where they are taking actual decommissioned monuments. We're supporting this as part of our monuments project and, and getting them to, and so like, this is what we support. Like, it costs a lot of money to get a decommissioned Robert E. Lee into someone's studio yeah. um, and saying to artists, you know, starting with Kara Walker, what what do you do with this? What do you make of this? Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I think that that is is going to be far more profound than anything explanatory or didactic material that is is some is needed. Um, right. But the things that we don't fully understand, we hope the artists will take us to. Well, and also, I think, I mean, for me, I think about Fred Wilson's Mining the Museum, you know, 25 years yes. ago, um, basically turning the museum on its head, making connections that scholars didn't make. You know, the same people that made the slave chains were the people that made the amazing silver teapots. And so, you know, for me, it really is, are there new ways by working with artists that they shine the light on the work we think we know? that then challenges yes. us to think about it in different ways. That's what excites me. Yes, absolutely. This question is from Laura Doctor. She writes, I'm just a housewife. I live in a small town in a flyover state. I have seen the destructive effects of the last presidency on my community. It has brought out the worst in loved ones and strangers alike to unexpected uh, degrees and in alarming ways. Please make sure you include suggestions for someone, her description, with no power and no reach, but with a strong will, like me, to participate in the hard work of unification. Thank you for your leadership. What would you that's say to really this doctor? Wow, that's pretty powerful. I mean, I think that, first of all, my notion is that you have power, right? Um, and that, yeah. but the notion is to look within your spear your community how do you sort of work with others to challenge the kind of oh the racial hatred the hatreds that's that have been ripped out over the last four years the bandage is gone um and i think that what excites me about what she said is that's really going to be the key to success of making change people who don't think that this that they're in this fight because they don't have power but who want to do something they're the very voices that can challenge this that can be seen as oh you're not the you know cultural elite telling us what to do but you're really someone who cares about this nation and cares about the healing so you know my notion is that let's find like-minded people and help your community become different because of your vision and your voice and I would just add on, um, I, I always think about um, the concentric circles that if we aren't working from the center out, then we aren't working as deeply and truly as we need to be. And it starts with the self and it starts then with the human beings in your home. You know, so what that housewife is doing to create consciousness and opportunity and ideas and processing with the people that she lives with and then it's your street and then it's your block and then it's your school district so and and you know what one, one of the things that that my um late father used to say is always use your voice because someone is always listening they may not let you know in the moment that they're listening but we need each other's words and I, I think that that is just so important. People are watching all of us, and certainly our children are watching us Absolutely. to see how we live. And just to, 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 you know, this phrase, what does it mean? Thank you, Laura, doctor, to participate in the hard work of unification, mm -hmm. uh, a challenge to us all. Um, from a wonderful poet and educator, Tony Asante Lightfoot also a community writing consultant. What are your institutions doing to bring educational and cultural opportunities to the incarcerated and formerly incarcerated? Um, you know, I think that when we built the museum, we said that's gotta be a major part of what we do, both sort of self telling that story um, in profoundly interesting and different ways, but also reaching out um, to the incarcerated community. One of the things that I've asked my new undersecretary for education, who is really for the first time, we have an undersecretary who's pushing education Smithsonian wide, is to make that one of the circles we're exploring. How do we bring some of the resources to the Smithsonian to the incarcerated? Because my belief is the incarcerated are crucial to change in this country, crucial to the success of the nation, but also 
the incarcerated deserve to be treated as humans, not incarcerated. And so my goal is to bring that educational power of the Smithsonian into those communities. And 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 I um, just want uh, to to say a few words about um, some of our Mellon work that I'm exceptionally proud of. Um, projects like you know, so being the biggest funder um, of prison higher education. Um, a degree granting higher education. So, you know, operating always on the assumption that um, there are porous lines between inside and outside. Everyone is someone's cousin, brother, wife, friend. Uh, you know, people come out of prison. Uh, so what does it mean for us to think about our communities as being continuous and therefore to believe that uh, the power of higher education is a, a right for everyone, I think, but also important to us as community. In addition to those uh, individuals, uh, we've my uh, like well, I don't know. I can't say my favorite, I, or maybe I can. The most moving project to me uh, is Dwayne Betts's Freedom Reads, and this yes. is a project uh, that is putting uh, Dwayne Betts formerly incarcerated when he was a young person, uh, a tremendous poet, a memoirist, uh, and now uh, a lawyer. And he is putting 500 book libraries in every single prison in this country. Beautiful libraries in beautifully designed bookcases that curve in such a way that even if there's not a room called library, the curvature invites you in to read. Mm -hmm. And we all know about book banning in prisons and how difficult it has become uh, to get books into prison. Um, so, um, you know, it, it, out, I talked about formal education, but even with just, you know, the mind opening powers of uh, of reading, which he himself discovered when he became a poet in jail. Um, so that's uh, uh, that's a, just a couple of things that that we're really proud of. Um, OK, what is this is from Sydney Key. What is the most critical demand of museum professionals over the next 10 years? Well, I think it's on two levels. First of all, I think for me, the most critical demand is that museum professionals need to recognize that their job is about fairness and justice. That I don't care what the museum is, it's really about using your resources to create a fair environment, whether it's a local community or the broader country. And I think the second piece is a firm commitment, not just a momentary dance, but a firm commitment to saying we are made better when we have a diverse staff. We are made better when we grapple fairly with the kind of institutional histories that we need to come to grips with to help us change these museums. So it really is about um, ultimately what is the greater good you provide in museums. And that greater good is about fairness, about justice, about modeling the behavior, modeling the staff that you should expect throughout the world, throughout the country. And so that's that's my commitment. I mean, there are things I can say about the certain kinds of training, but for me, it's the greater good. Mm. This question comes from Alfonso Giscom, who's program coordinator at the United States Holocaust Museum. How can people and museums join together to continue to share each other's truths, cultures, and histories? That's that's interesting. Yeah. I mean, I think that in some ways it's sort of part of it is about what I said initially, which is the real urge to collaborate, the need to collaborate, to think about how institutions like the African American Museum partners with the Holocaust Museum to sort of not just tell a story, but to raise fundamental questions about Black Jewish relationships historically and going forward. Um, and recognizing that by that collaboration, we're all becoming part of a new culture. We're learning about each other and we're doing things in a different way. That to me is really one of the great possibilities there are. And that's why I'd love to see more institutions doing work that sort of challenges them, that provides connectivity um, that is often missing, and that really sort of allows us to learn from each other in a way that isn't just let us celebrate what we once were, but really pointing us towards what we can be. 
Um, I have a quick question for you that I wanted to ask you earlier, and um, it's about your thinking around um, making Emmett Till's casket the most sanctified object in the museum, given that it's the object that you cannot photograph. Yes. How did you how did you make that decision with so many uh, wrenching and potent objects? Well, you know, I think part of it starts from knowing Mamie Till Mobley when I was in Chicago. Um, mm. And when I invited her to come have lunch with me, we're gonna have an hour lunch. She spent seven hours telling me everything that happened from the time she kissed Emma goodbye until the funeral. Mm. Um, and I was so fascinated. Now, now everybody knows the name now, but this is you know almost 20 years ago, well, more than 20 years ago. So I ended up writing pieces for the Chicago Tribune about her. Um, and we became friends. And she said to me that for 50 years, she carried the burden of remembering, of remembering Emmett. And she felt that other people had to do that. Um, and really shortly after that, she died. I came back to the Smithsonian when the casket was discovered. You know, he had been disinterred by the Justice Department, reinterred in a new casket. The original casket was supposed to be taken care of, and it wasn't. It was thrown into a shed. It was just horrible. And the family let me know. And I grappled with it. Should we collect the casket? Is that ghoulish? Um, so my first thought was, we'll collect it and preserve it, but probably never show it. Right? I built a special room so nobody can take, you know, selfies with it. Um, but then as we were working on the museum, I kept hearing Mamie's voice in my head talking about somebody's got to carry the burden of Emmett Till. And I was so moved by her. I thought, can we tell a story that is really that gives you the sort of pain of Emmett Till, but more importantly, the power of the mother um, that taking the worst moment in her life and using that to inspire new generations to fight for social justice. So when we collected the casket, we actually had a service at Robert's Chapel where Emmett Till was buried. And I was struck oh. by the sort of power of that. So when we came back, I said, let us recreate that moment, um, but let us do it in a way that the story is only told by people who participated in it, very little curatorial involvement. And then I said, I want this to be about how this woman inspired a nation um, because she could have been broken and given up. Instead, she used that. And she said to me, Emmett was crucified on the cross of racism and she was gonna do everything she can to end racism. So that's why we did, it was very hard. There were a lot of debates. There were people that said, you've got to show more of the broken body, all these kind of things. And I said, I did not want to exoticize the body. Um, I didn't want that to be the story. I wanted the power of a mother's love at the worst moment of mm -hmm. her life, using that love to change a nation. So that's how we got to mm -hmm. that. I still cry. Wow. I mean, I in the museum, I would go there every morning before I began just to sort of pay my respects and to thank maybe Mobley for what she did for all of us. Mm. Well, that is clearly where we need to conclude. And we are also uh, at time, but uh, we could talk forever. Uh, you are a treasure and we salute you. Everyone out there, I think, would agree that what you are giving and have given our nation and the world um, is something that cannot be measured. It cannot be measured and it will be there for people to learn from forever. So um, thank you. Thank you for, and thank you for being a joyful warrior. Always uh, such an important thing. This was a great conversation. And I, I want to also just, enough. oh, such a pleasure. And to all the people out here, let me tell you, this chat has been extraordinary. People are sharing resources, sharing links, asking more questions. It is a community unto itself. So thank you for bringing that uh, to your viewing and, and using that space as communal um, space. We look forward to seeing all of you out there at future Mellon Foundation events. You'll be hearing about another one coming very soon that will be held on February 23rd. And so off to your supper, have lovely evenings, and thank you so much for coming together today. And thank you, Lonnie Bunch. Oh, thank you, Eleanor. What the thank Elizabeth, it's so great for us to do this. So great. Thank you. Take care.
Bye.